Okay, thank you, T. Sam. Thanks, everyone, for being here for my talk, I guess. And I'm not going to bore you to death, I hope. But it's going to be excited. But sometimes I'm going to mention antenna electromagnetic. So Maxwell equation has to be in the presentation sometimes. So as I said, my presentation today, I need to stay closer to the, my presentation today is going to be about smart cooperative wireless sensor networks. But I'll start by introducing a little bit about the background behind the work we're doing now, which is the body-centric wireless communication, the antennas, the radio, the electromagnetism, the computation behind it, and what we do and what we want to achieve from an application perspective. So the outline of my talk today is going to be about why do we care about body-centric communications, the application, the challenges, where do we face the challenges. As an antenna electromagnetics engineer, I want to know how can I actually get the best of my signals, how can I get the best radio devices to propagate everywhere. Then talking a little bit about the, the domains of the user-centric communication, which is in, on, and off body, because it's really important to have the complete picture. And you see throughout the talk that one of our main applications is really in healthcare, which is really people need to see or know everything about your body you know, your heart rate, the implants, stimulating your organs, and so on. Uh, and these are really the motivations behind our work. And then talking about how can we get these sensors smarter? Because everyone, when we talk about polycentric communication or wireless sensor network, the first question that pops up to mind is batteries. Are they going to last for long? If it's for one day, is the patient willing or the user willing to change it manually? Can they do that themselves? Or they need to use other people's um, ex expertise, assistance, and so on. So first, before I, and I like to say that contribution acknowledgement because not everything I presented is my work, and really, barely anything is my work, but it's the PhD students, really, and, and the collaborators with us, uh, the names here from Queen Mary and from different parts uh, of University of London and other universities internationally and nationally as well. So why body-centric wireless communication? When we started in 2003, I remember this research, we, we had the challenge of wearable computers coming out to the University of Birmingham. And it was a really interesting thing, because you have the display on your head, you have the keyboard in your hand, and you have uh, the processor on your waist. And the problem was it's all wired. And the more devices you have in your body, the more wires you include. So it's obstructive. You can't move easily, and you have this a challenge of changing everything. You need to unplug, unplug, and so on. But wireless communication became really a little bit popular at that point, and people thought about you know, the wireless scalability, the um, operability between devices. We can get Bluetooth to communicate with other devices if we have the right protocols and so on. So we thought about taking this to wireless. And like everybody else, we, we started by just unplugging these cables and replacing them with the wireless devices. And it didn't work, as we expected. Because everyone thought that antenna is just taking a clothes hanger and put it in the back of the car. And it's not any longer, because it's not as easy as that. You can't just take a wire, put it on a device, and say, yes, it's going to work, and it's going to give me the radio reception I dreamt of. It's not. It's actually a, a complicated science that we require to understand Maxwell's equation. How Maxwell's equation explained to us the behavior of signals from a time, frequency, and spatial perspective. And we do that through computation and analysis, through theoretical analysis, and experimental analysis. If some of you have seen the antenna lab already, we have, we have really extensive, comprehensive antenna measurement facilities, which we nearly measure everything we actually research and work theoretically on. And as I said, there's always have to be a motivation for us at the application they are here, which is really the healthcare, military, sport, and entertainment, tagging objects. And you've seen now RFIDs and uh, monitoring objects, uh, tagging on clothing, and people monitoring patients, doctors, healthcareers, and so on. And military, obviously, is an important thing, but today I'm not going to go much into military because it's, I like saying that it's classified. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> I enjoy saying that every time I present because it's easy, so I don't have to present the research we did for that. But the main motivation for us is, is really the healthcare aspect. And when we first started, we looked at you know, the need in the market for devices such as that, wireless sensor network that can actually monitor your behavior or activity every step of the day and then give you a feedback or alert saying you need to contact the GP, you need to give information back to your healthcare, you really need to change your lifestyle and so on. But we're not looking at it from implementing a, a GUI or a user interface or a fancy thing to do because our expertise on how to get the radio signal out of your body to wearable devices and then to off-body access points, which could be your access point, your mobile phone, or any other device that receives a signal. And here's lots of numbers with millions, and always when you see millions, you get excited because saying, I'm working in the right domain. I'm really, if implementing something or doing an application, this will give me a return or turnover. This is one of the applications called BodyTel, and they're based on a simple Bluetooth device that takes some information from off-the-shelf ECG, collects this information, 
send it to a processor or a laptop and get the information and feedback to you saying this is what's happening and this is how you need to change your eating habits or your lifestyles and so on. And there are so many commercial units out there now, but they all depend on off-the-shelf unit, and they all depend on understanding that you put an antenna on a wireless device or you put just a wireless interface to your device and it should work directly. The other important parameters here is the aging population. It's really where we're actually pushing these boundaries of having everything wireless, having everything continuous monitoring of the devices around you. In the UK, by 2030, it's going to be 24% of people over 65. In the USA, it's 20%, and in China, it's 13%. And any Chinese person knows what 13% in China means, right? It, it beats everyone else in the world, right? There's lots of people needing to have continuous monitoring, continuous healthcare, continuous activity monitoring in order to um, make their life healthier and happier, really. So for us, we started by looking at how interference happens, how electromagnetic waves propagate from on-the-body wearable devices or sensors to, for example, a person next to you or to another device on your leg or your head or to an access point over there. And when we started, we thought there's no IEEE standard to define how we're going to work or how we're going to model this system. It just started that at that point in 2007, IEEE started working on a standardization, which we contributed to, and we gave indications of how, what kind of channel models we need to use, what kind of environment behavior we need to include our systems in. <clears throat> what kind of system performance parameters that we need to include in order to ensure the best performance of the system. But now, since February 2012, there's a standard for body area networks for low power application, which is really aimed at healthcare monitoring performances and so on. So it's nothing else but low power in order to ensure that you have a longer battery life, you don't have interference, and also you can get simple devices off the shelf or uh, base box devices that you can operate within a system. So the domains, as I said before, the on-body and off-body, every domain of the body-centric wireless communication is quite complex on its own because there are communications from different devices. This scenario being the most complicated for us because it's a dynamic environment and at least it's always moving. And from a movement, you get Doppler shift, you get shifting in frequency, you get changes of the environment or the signals. So the predictability of how the signal behaves is out of the window. And we need actually to make these predictabilities dynamic. So we need to ensure that with the environment change, by reading the signal information, we can actually predict what kind of environment that person is in. And after that, we can apply our radio channel or statistical channel models. The embody is something different, because inside the body, every person here have different organs inside the body, I hope. So inside the person, then each organ have different electric properties. At different frequencies, these organs behave differently. So now it's not only the different organs that have different uh, permittivity or what we call conductivity, but they all have different values at different frequencies. So 2.4 gigahertz or at uh, the 3G, 3 gigahertz, or the cellular network 900 megahertz, all the organs behave differently. And for implant, you can think for the on-body application and the off-body, it doesn't make a huge difference because it's, it's barely less than 1% of the signal that propagates inside the body. For implant, it makes a huge difference because it's inside the body that propagates the signal. And we need to understand how that behaves and how that acts. So from looking at all these aspects, we, we, we kind of define the challenges we face in our research, which is really the technologies, you know, the wave propagation, the antennas. What about uh, the usability, the architecture of the system is, itself? What kind of system will people accept? Does it have to be something large that they can see, like you know, the progression in designing mobile phones, the bigger the screen, the better, or the smaller the device it is, the thinner, and so on? And also looking at the, the software uh, architecture behind it. Do we need really software that can actually give us a more intelligent system to predict what kind of environment or what kind of signal we need to transmit and so on. And for us, we, we love to do experimental things. And, and what we've done is we started by looking at simple simulation, numerical. We get a computer, we put a sensor, an antenna next to a human body, a small part of the human body, and see how it acts. And then verify that through experimental. So we get the channel models, we get the statistical channel data. We, we, we do lots of data collection and data processing. And from that, we get one model that we say, this could be the comprehensive model that actually can let you present your body area network. And then from that, we apply this to a system model, either Bluetooth or Zigbee or off-the-shelf system, or a system that we think that will be the best one, which is an in-house uh, system. And then we test the VR performance, the symbol rate, uh, the, the kind of information we get in. Do we have information continuous? When do we have a sleep and wake? So we say batteries and so on, all the different aspects related. 
And before moving into the details of what we do with wireless sensor network, what is interesting for us is that sometimes the research you do leads to something else that is really interesting. And for us, it was the work that we actually spent time on, on the ultra-wideband. We're sending a huge wide, band, uh, wide bandwidth uh, signal, which is in time to many, it's a narrow nano signals. It's really the advantage of the fact that these signals, when they reflect from different parts, like the wall, the floor, and so on, you can clearly see where the multipath coming from. You have your clear first path, and then you have all the multipath component. So it's easier to process, it's less complex to detect where the signal is coming from, and hence it's really good for localization. We can actually monitor or tag where that person or that object is. And this is the recent research we're working on, and this is something we have recently started working with a company working with a robotic hand, the shadow robot company. So what we want to do is monitor the movement of the human hand and let the robot does this, do the same thing as what the hands is doing. So it's tele-robotic control of stuff like risky areas, hazardous areas and so on. And the other aspect is the motion capture. One of the advantages in you know, athletes' performance enhancements and so on is being able to monitor the movement of the limbs and then asking the athletes or the patient to repeat these uh, uh, movements uh, through an interface. So it's like a mirror, but a virtual mirror through radio signals, nothing more complex, no cameras, no uh, problem with uh, obstruction or non-line of sight communication. And this is just the robotic kind of an example to show that the current hand uses a glove, which is based on piezoelectric circuits, so it uses materials, so they break, they're expensive, you have to change them, the issue with the safety and contaminations and so on. So it needs to be really free from all these problems on challenges. And the other work that is really interesting for us is what Nanda at the back there is doing, which is really exciting for us, because now we get the part, the interaction part, the media part, back into the radio and antennas. We know these people that are just sitting in the antennas lab and looking at things from outside. But what people like Nanda does is that how can you take an advantage of the RFID, uh, the closeness of the RFIDs to the body, and then how can you use them to the advantage of bringing the virtual social network into an actual physical social network and encourage people to communicate, to uh, um, exchange data and to get information from one point to another. Moving on, when we started the domain, the first thing I start with is the embody, which is something exciting when we started working on. At the time we started working on the embody communication, which is taking information from the implant, there was an article on uh, the IEEE Explorer about a person in America, I can't remember which university he was in, but he did it on his own, not affiliated with any university. He took an RFID, he put it in a small capsule, which is the pill capsule you get. You can open it, you replace it with something. So he put an RFID in it, and he put it in his hand, in this part of the hand. It's safe to put it here because there is nothing there. And he used that to control everything in his house. Then people get excited about it, saying, RFID, inside the body, you can control stuff with it. So can we do more about it? Because he has to be close to the door in order to open it, close to the computer in order to detect it. So the range has to be very close. Then people started thinking about one of the most invasive techniques used in medical history ever, I think, I don't know, maybe there's something more, is endoscopy. It has to go from one, from your mouth or from somewhere else. It's not right to mention it here. So endoscopy is really invasive, and it's not the right thing to do. So people started thinking about how can we replace this with something wireless? So no cable, nothing there, and I know if I swallow a capsule, biodegradable and biocompatible capsule, it will leave my body in 24 hours because the body can't digest it, so it has to leave it. But while it's in the body, I want to take pictures and collect these pictures. And that's what this company, which is Philip Shanghai, was interested in. They asked us if we can actually numerically model the behavior of an implant from inside the body, and also if we can give them initial experimental investigation. They didn't just want to do simple frequency use, which is the medical implant communication system, which is already some people are working on that. But they wanted to test different frequencies, because everybody knows the higher the frequency, the higher the data rate, which means the higher the quality of the images you get from inside the body. So we tested for this company different frequencies, which is the um, medical communication, 400 megahertz, the uh, ISM lower band, 866 megahertz, and the higher band, 2.4 gigahertz. And we looked at it numerically, if we put a, a, a source, a radio source inside the stomach, if the stomach is full or empty. One of the misconceptions that people always use is that they think that when the, stomach is, when the stomach is empty, it's full of air. But it's not, it shrinks in size. And it's the permittivity, which is the electric pro property that defines the propagation of the wave, changes. Because now it's not fully air, however, it shrinks in size and it's, a, it's an average permittivity of muscles and air and vacuum and so on. 
And then we started looking at how much of that wave we can get outside the body. The attenuation of these waves from the center of the source to the left or the right of the human body, which frequency gives you the best performance, the lower frequency, the better the signal we get out, however, the lower the data rate. So there's always a trade-off, there's always an optimization. But what's interesting for us was here is the fact that Using a higher frequency, 2.4 gigahertz, we did experimental work, not in a human body, but in animal organs. In this case, what we did, we scanned the surface of the phantom we have. So we took the human phantom, we went the butcher at 8 a.m. in the morning, we took organs like liver, kidneys, and so on, we put it inside the phantom, we stuck an antenna in it, and then we wanted to see how much of the signal we get out on the human surface. And what's interesting for us is the ability for us to locate where that capsule is sending information from. And that's interesting, because one of the challenges at the moment is that if you swallow a pill, they don't exactly know where the pill is. They depend on the image in order to analyze if this is part through the esophagus or the stomach and so on. But being able through some radio signals and uh, multiple scans to detect where that capsule is sending the image from gives you more information and hence better assessment of the case you're dealing with. And to take this work further, this is uh, the wireless sensor lab in the antennas area. And if you pass by there, you see it. It's got a mock hospital suite. It's got a meeting room. So we do lots of indoor uh, uh, propagation measurements and testing over there. And what we've done is that we took um, an implant which is inside the phantom, and we're trying to investigate the amount of propagation we get out of that signal. And this is at 400 megahertz to get uh, larger distance and larger coverage. The issue with implant we found out is subject specific. Right, because when we did numerical modeling, different BMIs, different sides of the human gave us different outage probability of the system. And in addition to that, it's the type of antenna you're using for this wireless sensor, it's the type of uh, encapsulation or isolation material you're using, because it reduces the amount of power you have. However, this kind of study gave us indication that you can use 2.4 gigahertz frequency, which is a higher frequency, high data rate, and it can give you a better information of the images of, of the day of the localization but you have to trade off the range. It depends on what the range you want and how far you want to communicate in this case. Then in order to link or to complete the domain of the body-centric wireless communication, a bulk of our work was really on on-body communication. And we did this work with the University of Birmingham who had an expertise in wearable computers and antennas in general. And the main challenge for us was how to design an antenna that is flexible, robust, doesn't change with the changes in the environment, minimizes the changes in the frequency or the operation parameter when you put it in different human bodies or different parts of the body. Because one thing interesting that we found out is that an antenna on the left chest doesn't perform the same as an antenna on the right chest. And it's, it's nothing to do with, for example, you've got a bigger right arm than a left arm and so on. But it's really the organs underneath this antenna. Because antenna sees the background as something that is part of the design. They look at the background, if they don't have any shielding between the antenna and the body, the organ as part of the permittivity that allows it to send information with a certain efficiency. And you have more organs, for example, on the left side than the right side, and this will cause the reduce in power efficiency of the antenna sending the signals out. And the other problem we had is the dynamic environment that the human body is operating at. So if you have intra-body communication, sending information from one body to another, like the case of a health carer getting ECG signals and so on from the person, then there's a problem of the person lying on the bed, the person lying on his back or in the stomach, then you lose the communication link. Us, as the human bodies, we really absorb the energy or block it totally. We're closer to metal at higher frequency than anything else because nothing passes through us. We minimize everything that goes through us. And then we need to come up with, an, with, with a technique to overcome this problem. And before we do that, we really need to look at all the data performance and all the statistical analysis behind the radio channels and how sensors sense information. And for that, we use our cheap labor PhD students, and they're here. Yeah, so. Yeah, we always use them, but that's not a problem because they give us really a variety of data and variety of sizes that allows us to tell people that this channel model is based on something realistic, on something that statistically derives from extensive data measurement. And that is important because if you do one set of measurement, don't repeat it, people never trust the results. But you need to do a number of uh, uh, measurements throughout the days, nights, and uh, months, and years, and repeat them again and again and ensure that all the statistical data you get are matching or correlated highly with each other. So then your channel model is accurate and is accurate representation of what you can do. As I said, one, one of the bulk of the work we did is about ultra-wideband communication. And they become really exciting because they give you very high data rate. 
and the power requirement is very low. And it's nothing to do with us or the technology itself. It's actually the control from the regulators. The first introduction of ultra-wideband uh, from America FCC allowed something around minus 45 dBm per megahertz, which is really low compared to anything out there. And that's because they want to stop interference behind this wide bandwidth uh, technology, which is something from 3 to 10.6 gigahertz with any other technologies like GPS, like uh, 3G and so on. In the UK, it's even more strict rules. It's 85 dBm per, minus 85 dBm per megahertz. Ultra wideband gave us different challenges. It's not a conventional antenna. It's not about where the antenna is placed and how can it perform. The problem with wide bandwidth or ultra wideband bandwidth is that now they don't only operate from a frequency perspective, but they also operate from a time domain perspective, which means they're sending pulses. Now, an antenna in the center of this room does not usually transmit the same pulse in all spatial directions because they have the way they're structured, they don't usually give you the perfect omnidirectional radiation, which means. For example, at 90 uh, degrees, you receive slightly different pulse shape than the one you received at zero degrees. So the pulse fidelity, or ensuring that a transient spatial distribution of the antenna is met, is an important aspect to design an impulse radio system. And this is the work that uh, we've done and we're still working on for different parts, uh, for different applications, looking at how the pulses changes their behavior, including inside the environment or from different antenna types, and how we're trying to match this information and get the best fidelity or improve, optimize the antenna design we're doing. Uh, this is just, I like putting this because it's got a picture of me. Just to show you that I do some work. Yes, I do. <laughs> so we put the antennas on the human body and we're trying to see the performance changes or how does the human body affect the antenna performance itself. Inside the chamber, it's an ideal environment. If you haven't seen it, go to the antenna lab and check it out. We have really cool antenna lab. And then outside in the lab to get into our analysis, the reflection from the different walls, the items, the equipments, and so on. And as I said, we're trying to use this pulse information not only to ensure that the antenna optimization is working well, but we want to know from the pulse shape, from the amount of the amplitude from the face of the pulse if the person is doing a certain activity. And this is really important because not using anything ex except the radio signal or the pulse transmitted from a sensor worn by the user, can you detect if the user is sitting down, walking, uh, sleeping, or eating, or doing a different activity. And you can tell this by the radio signal indicator because the repetition of an event creates um, a, a crossing rate, which we call the crossing of an average rate that tells you the information about if that person is doing something repetitive, which means they're either eating, walking, running, and it depends on the speed that the person is performing the task at. And also, the channel response will give you information about where the person is. If you don't have high multipath information coming from different direction, it means you have a clear impulse response. You have one pulse that is repeated so often, and then it tells you that he is walking in an outdoor range or in a room where there is no clutter or no reflections at all. And we do this test also with, uh, with a treadmill machine where we put the person with the radio device on a treadmill machine and ask the person to uh, run with a certain speed, for example, starting from one kilometer per second to two, three, ten. And then from the radio signal changes, we were able to detect accurately with uh, a correlation of around 90% the right activity that the person is doing. And this is one of our PhD students. He's not running anymore. He's not in the lab locked running like a rat, but we let him go somewhere else. Yeah, so he's free now. And then we plug this data into an ultra-wideband system, which is an option of the system, which is a frequency division multiplexing system, and see if our statistical channel data will give you something useful, will give you something to the system designer that they can take and design their system based on this data. Because everything you see around you about the wireless devices is not plucked from nowhere. It's plucked from data that they measured and they understand that. If we have a system with a certain power limit, with a certain uh, modulation technique, I'll get a performance of a certain value. And what is interesting for us is how this performance actually changes depending on uh, the kind of uh, location on the body. And this is show you uh, the bit error rate according to the energy to noise values. We're trying to work in a low range of energy to noise, around 4 dB, because that's the requirement of ultra wideband, and this is what we want our system to do. A low power system, which means less consumption of power, and hence it gives you better um, the battery life and a longer life for the system in order to operate. And the outcome, the major outcome of the study we've done on that is a recommendation of areas where you can place your wireless sensor that will give you acceptable results from a bit error rate performance. 
We're not telling people that you have to put this sensors in a specific location as numbered here, but it gives you an indication of areas of the body where if you place your wireless sensor to monitor, for example, ECG, body temperature, blood pressure, and so on, this will give you the best performance, so something around the lower abdomen, uh, the top right of the leg, and then the heads, and so on. The arm being the worst, and I guess you can guess why the arm being the worst, right? Because it's dynamic. Sometimes people talk like me with their hand going everywhere. I don't want to mention Italian because there's so many Italians here. So they talk with their hand everywhere, so it will be hard to predict what they're doing or how, how the information is transmitted from one point to another. Or some people actually do something very uh, stable, which means we can actually predict their activity or if they're doing, for example, eating or walking in a certain space and so on. So these are recommendations, not really something we're saying to people, you have to put the sensor on because you can never force a user to place an, uh, a sensor somewhere or something specific. And all that r the results we've done so far, it was based on uh, conventional antennas, conventional devices that we take, we play around with, we manipulate in order to get the information uh, from one point to another. What was interesting for us is getting all the information we have and the understanding of uh, the data processing from a, a real transceiver perspective or a wireless sensor perspective. And this wireless sensor, I don't have exactly the sensor itself, but I have something with similar size. It was as big as this sensor which you place either on a tag, you hang it on yourself, or on the wrist, and the whole point of this uh, sensor is to monitor the activity of users, and this is really users in a certain industrial building, so they want to see if their users are doing a certain activity throughout the day, they're moving around the office, or they're doing different floors, and they have interaction between the employees, and so on. One of the biggest issues with this device is that when they put it on the body with whatever antenna they use, it didn't work. This, the transceiver, tells them that using a Zigbee, it should give you a range of 10 meters but what they got something less than one meter, and they didn't understand what's happening. Why? Because they've done what everyone else is doing. You take a close hand here, you put it on the back of the car, and voila, you get a radio transceiver. It doesn't work like this. So what we needed to do is look at the details of the sensor. They put an antenna not based on the fact that this sensor will be close to the human body, because the human body influences the frequency where this antenna will operate, or the wireless device operate. It will change the frequency. So instead of working at 2.4 gigahertz, the sensor was working at 1.8 gigahertz. So there's zero power coming at 2.4 gigahertz, no information at all. So what we've done, we went through numerical modeling, experimental analysis, we changed the antenna behavior, and at the end we managed to improve the antenna performance. And what you see here, the green, is the antenna as given to us, or the wireless device as given to us by the industrial collaborator. The black one is the long monopole you see everywhere with readers and so on. So it's large, it gives you signal everywhere. And the red one is our design incorporated within the transceiver. So understanding the electromagnetic behavior of radio propagation we place on human body can give a big uh, advantage. And this makes a huge difference between conventional wireless sensors and wireless sensors for body area network. They need to be designed with in mind that this will be used around the human body, which is really something complex from an electromagnetic perspective. And this is usually what we put it on a human phantom, and this is the an average American male model, and that's why it's slightly larger. But now people are deriving more models based from Japan, from Europe, and so on. And one of the recent work we did is working with Imperial to get subject-specific numerical modeling. So they give us a statistical shape of the person through an MRI scan, and what, we, and what we're trying to do is fill that shape with the different organs. This is challenging because what they're trying to, they give us a surface mesh, and then we need to translate that into a 3D form model that allows us to put different organs with different sizes inside. The thing that's missing on, on the work we're doing now is the different sizes of the organs. However, we use approximation and estimation, especially at higher frequencies. And as I said, usual Maxwell equation allows us to see what kind of wave propagates around the body. And the interesting part about this work we did is the fact that we always had a question. You have a sensor in the front of the body, you have a sensor at the back, we're receiving some kind of signal. If we think about it theoretically and analytically, what we see is that the propagation through the human body will give you a loss of 70 dB. So you get no information at the back. But what happened here is we get some information at the back and in an acoustic chamber, so there's no reflection at all. And the reason is the law of diffraction the geometrical diffraction of the wave around the human curvature allows us to have some wave trapped between the skin and the muscle layers and escapes at the back, which means we're using some kind of wave guide with the human organs or human tissues, allowing us to give information out. And this is what's really important for us in order to work more on wave-guided antennas, antennas that launch wave on the human surface rather than everywhere. And, and this really, this part, this specific part, understanding how the wave behavior and what kind of wireless devices we need, is pushed us to look at 
how we can go even smarter, thinking about system that is actually intelligent, that think about how you can propagate signals in mind that you work in a certain environment or not, and how to actually change their behavior in order to um, give you the better accuracy and better communication. So what we try to look at, and this is the recent work we worked in, is how cooperative networks operate. Cooperative network concept is a, co a concept that's been there for ages from a cellular perspective, from different wireless perspective. But we wanted to take that for the on-body communication. How we can maximize the lifetime of the battery, the energy consumption, how can we reduce that? And how can we get the best of the signal? If you remember when I talked about the case where you have a health carer on a hospital bed, when you lie on your back or in your stomach, the issue is the loss of information, right? So the loss of information for some kind of monitoring, it means you're dead. If there's no ECG signal, it means you're dead, right? From a virtual, if we depend only on computers and not seeing the person. So what we want to achieve is that how you can get the best information with no loss of data at all. How can we actually use sensors that we expect people to have around their body or their mobile phones or their wireless devices and so on to cooperate with each other to send the information out? So you always get an always on device uh, with a higher quality signal so you get a better assessment of the person. The example application we use, or the data sample we use to achieve that is for ECG signal monitoring, which is the ambulatory monitoring for physiological responses. So we have an off-the-shelf ECG uh, electrodes. Uh, we have data that we collected through a wire system, and then we use that payload in order to mimic the information we need to send wirelessly. We used wireless devices that sense this information similar to this one I have here that takes the data and send it uh, through a, a device out to a base station or a different sensor. We set up a scenario where we have four or five sensors scattered around the user. Uh, we're trying to investigate first if we're using a star topology, which means all the sensors sending to one location, what happens to the device? What oh, doesn't show? Oh, no, the person is not dead. There is a CG signal, sorry. Yeah? Like, you can't see it, but there is. Believe me. Trust, trust, trust me, really, <laughs> at this point. So what we did, we scattered the sensors around the body, and we're trying to see what the star topology will do, which means all the sensors sending the information to one half. And then opposite to that, the cooperative network. So they all communicating with each other. They all telling each other what is the best route through me or through me or through sensor four and so on. So everyone is trying to get the information out. The first instant you think that this will give you a better performance, surely, right? Because it's saving the energy, it's sending data out and so on. And this is what we based our analysis on and we worked on that. So you have a person standing in a cake chamber, you have a person sitting in an office environment and then trying to play with a different network topology. In the first setup of the topology, we managed to get a network gain of six dB. So comparing cooperative to star topology, the cooperative gives us an advantage of a network gain of six dB, better signal quality. But then we thought, surely there's something better we can achieve here. Because we use a simple algorithm, which is the time wake up equal time. Uh, the waiting time for a signal to radio information was also equal. But then if we adapt this information more in order to increase the gap between a star and cooperative from a packet loss ratio or the energy consumption ratio, we can get a better performance. We can push our system even further. And for that, we use a, a system called Centelamot, which has got an antenna working at 2.4 gigahertz, a programmable system. So we can change the behavior of that system. And we can plug different antennas on top of the system in order to allow us to investigate also the antenna effect on the radio channel behavior. What we've done here, we made this waiting time adaptive. We take a hub, which is the sensor that working on the hub to relay the information, and adaptive waiting time. So looking at the data from a previous time and adapting the waiting time to a longer period if you have higher data rate passing through the system, and so on. So this will ensure that through uh, an analysis of the cost of the link, for example, between one sensor and another, what is the best route? So we have a threshold. Any link that have uh, a radio signal indicator less than minus 30 dB, we neglect it and we don't use it as a direct link. But we have to use a hub to relay the information through it to where our destination is. What's interesting here, making everything adaptive and intelligent and thinking about the radio environment through this algorithms and intelligent thinking, allows us to get a network gain of around 14 dB. This is the network gain of the gain of the power delivered from one sensor to the destination. Now, what is interesting, because our motivation always been increasing the, life, the battery life of the system, increase, uh, reducing the uh, power consumption, is that if you take an off-the-shelf system, like whatever transceiver you have here, if you use it to transmit, if you use it to receive, and if you use it just to relay information, it consumes exactly the same amount of power. 
right? So this is a problem. We're just taking stuff and applying through it. Because this meant in this case, we're actually consuming more power using the cooperative system. And instead of sensor one sending information to sensor three, which is maybe low power information, you boost the power up. Now we need to use three hubs or two hubs to get to that destination. And these two hubs, they don't just relay information with minimum current, but they use the full current amount. And this has really pushed us, which is what we're working on recently, I mean, I don't have any results at the moment, is how to get uh, this system even pushed further with designing uh, a bespoke uh, relay or hub information. So a sensor that operates as only relay and consumes the minimum power just to transmit this information or pass it through the network to your destination. And this is the work we're doing with NICTA, which is National ICT in Australia. And this graph here shows you really the, the, the different sensors uh, at, uh, with uh, different topologies like single hops or multi hops and the different power consumption. So you have the energy here, and you can see in some cases the multi hop have more energy users than the star mesh, which is sending the data directly. However, what cooperative does or advantage point that it does at the moment is that we never lose information. We never have a blockage because it always avoids the blockage in order to get the information from the back of the body into the access point or into the health carers' uh, pads or mobiles and so on. This really caused us to understand with the antenna and the guided wave antenna, the, the stuff I talked about, there's more surface waves and so on, how can we actually design antennas that changes their behavior more? So making the antenna flexible, not a flexible from a perspective of you can bend it, but flexible from a perspective that I can change its radiation pattern. I can have one that transmits directly out to a base station or on the human body, so it changes the radiation mode. And this is the work that we, we actually concentrated on recently on cognitive radio. So it's part, it's a concept part of cognitive radio. We're not designing cognitive radio of the future, but we're borrowing the concept of cognitive radio to design flexible front-end radios. Because this will allow us to change electronically using a current or a signal uh, through an intelligent control how the antenna behaves, what kind of bandwidth it operates at, what kind of radiation modes it has, and also what kind of properization it has, right? You heard of the, the concept of diversity techniques. You know, the more antenna, the more data you collect. Signal coming from this direction is different than the one coming from this direction and from the top. The more you collect, the better the uh, bit error rate you get for your system. Uh, and this is uh, a work uh, which is a recent work done by Tamara Bufour, one of the PhD students. And uh, th this antenna is quite unique from the perspective <coughs> that it's simpler to um, actually realize it's less complex than most of the uh, reconfigured system out there, and it allows you to change a behavior of the bandwidth of the antenna based on the current that you provide to the system, using a concept of filtering, stopping, and so on, which is something to, to do with matching in electromagnetics and so on. The question we always get is that if you have an ultra-wideband antenna, why do you need to tune it? If it's an ultra-wideband antenna, it operates at a wider bandwidth, and hence it covers everything. So why tuning the antenna in this case? Because tuning the antenna will ensure you get a better efficiency. It's a maximum matching you have here. So you're matching around minus 25 dB. So it's only a small percentage of the signal that you're rejecting, comparing to a matching around minus 15 or minus 10 dB. So you improve the total efficiency of the antenna. And also, this antenna can work as a filtering, because now these systems are expected to work with in, in, uh, um, in operation environment with different wireless technologies. And this means that it will interfere with it. There will be a problem of interference between the devices. And tuning the antenna into a specific band will ensure that you filter out the information. What is exciting for us is this antenna working at different modes. So you can actually get the wireless sensor uh, sending data out to access points. And if you want to communicate cooperatively along the human body, you can make it propagate only along the body by changing the radiation mode. Again, using the concept of current distribution of the path of the signal that's going through and so on. How we control this is a system we got, uh, it's an, a configurable system from ETHOS Research, USRP, Universal uh, Radio uh, Programmable Device, that allows us to change the current that we control the antenna with based on the feedback from the environment you're operating at. So the environment around us, if we're operating with this, understand that this part of the spectrum is quite congested and busy, so we need to avoid using this spectrum and switch on to another spectrum. So something we call the spectrum sensing, which you hear part of cognitive radio. In addition to that, our knowledge of the environment allows us to determine if we operating in a cluttered environment or an outdoor range or a range with no much clutter or objects to reflect the signal in. And hence we can determine if we're using a normal wireless body area network or a cooperative wireless sensor network in order to get the information from one point to another. This 
actually is advantageous when it comes to localization. Because a prior knowledge of how the uh, in environment is behaving will allow us to have a better accuracy for localization. And, and this is really about localizing where the sensors on the human body is and also capturing the motion of the human limbs. What people are interested in, for example, gait analysis after operation or an athlete's injury, is if the leg is performing as well as you expected, if the arm is doing the right movement, for example, in sport performance monitoring, if the rowing or the rower actually is doing the right movement in order to get the best performance. The system allows you to do this portably. So it allows you to take the system within a real event and monitor the user's behavior. And, and, and the challenge that people face with this at the moment with the conventional radio system is that you have so many interferers, which means the accuracy is really large. But we're using system with a high, uh, ultra wideband like uh, the UWB system, you can get a better accuracy. With, uh, at, at the moment, we can achieve localization of around, uh, from, ranging from really a sub-centimeter to five-centimeter accuracy, which is something very good comparing to all other systems out there. We're comparing to our system, obviously, it's not comparable at the moment to the um, Sorry, the optical motion capture system like the Bicon and the stuff we have in the school. However, it's giving you this portability and ease of configuration and also the cost effectiveness. You don't need line of sight. A radio signal can be detected from a reflector from the wall or the ceiling, as long as you know how to deal with that radio signal and the impulse response coming from that radio signal. And before really finishing, the last thing we, we, um, we're talking about body centric network. We looked at the in-body, we looked at the on-body, we looked at the off-body, the antenna behavior, the system behavior, the different off-the-shelf system. Do we need an in-house system? What numerical technique we use? Now the challenge is that how we can actually um, collaborate with other people within a domain like the medical school and so on to work with smaller devices, more complex devices. And this is the work we do on nanocommunication. Because now the question is people are thinking of using nanobots, nanorobots and so on to stimulate the organs to change information from one point to another. So what we're trying to understand is that how we can get uh, parameters of the human body at the nanoscale, also at higher frequencies like the terahertz. One lacking knowledge domain is the fact that we don't have sufficient information to investigate how the blood, the muscle, the bone behave at terahertz. And this is important because if we know how electrically they behave, we can predict the channel behavior. And from that, we can desi design new, smaller system, smaller clusters of nanocommunication, which instead of having one body area network, we have multiple nano networks inside that can communicate with each other. And understanding how they can communicate from an electromagnetic perspective, we can get this information on a hierarchical system, inside the body to a wearable system, and then off to anywhere you want to get this information out for. And, and for this work, we really can't do it on our own. So we're working with, uh, we have Kay Yang here working with the medical school, and this is with uh, Professor Mike Philippot, who's an expert in sampling uh, 3D skin uh, tissue layers and measurement. Because if we want to do it ourselves, we have to go through a year of ethical approval, but they have it already. So this is the shortcut. I'm using this slide because I love using it, because <laughs> okay. it's got circles and it moves. Okay, so <laughs> for, for really, what we're looking at, and for, for the challenge for us really in this domain is still that's missing really is we're working, yes, on intelligent antenna and cooperative antenna and so on, but people now are looking at novel antennas, antennas from graphene uh, systems, antennas that actually can automatically tune themselves without any control, a material, including clever materials, that allows you to change the behavior of the parameter of the antenna without having an external input on the antenna. So in, in this case, you get a better control, less power consumptions, and so on. Uh, advanced material. W one of the big things we're working on and we've been working on is flexible antenna, which is textile antenna, which is something really useful for us. We have people from the media and art technology, Nanda and Barrett and other people, that actually work on how can you make this antenna better. You can crumble it, you can wet it, it comes out, it works as an antenna. It might take five seconds, it, it's off case, but then it's go again and it behaves the same as a normal antenna. It's not as simple as just Need, um, sewing an antenna on a textile jeans, I think in this case. Uh, we had a great student who can do this, by the way. So the problem with this is that if you're in a wet environment, if you're in a heated environment, it behaves totally different. And it's the electromagnetics of uh, material and their permittivity and their conductivity changes with whatever they're operating around or surrounded with. 
bioengineering. The recent thing I talked about, nanocommunication, biocompatibility, the implant. We really need an input from interdisciplinary people such as the medical school, biologists, chemists, to understand how we can actually uh, design a better system to give them information that they require and how to get data that will be useful for them to assess, for example, the behavior of a person, the behavior of a cell, uh, the nanocommunication, and so on. And also the last part is intelligent communication, intelligent network. This is where the smart part comes into. Networks that actually allows you to get the best signal with minimum power. Getting the signal to be greener and making the whole wireless body area network a network that is always on minimum power, that gives you always useful information with data that you can use in order to assess a person or give an indication or alert or make it use it in an entertainment system in general. And by doing that, we can make the body-centric network a complete, a near comprehension of the, how the body area network should operate or should behave. And by that, I think I'm going to go through a summary, but you can, I just already said it. So we need really to understand better how we can design better antenna. We need to understand better how the radio wave behaves. We've done extensive work for now 11 or 12 years on how wave behaves around the human body. But now we're moving into the application layer. Does it actually fit all the application we intend to use our system for? And that's why now we're working with industries, with people who care about healthcare monitoring, sport monitoring, and so on. And, and, and you know, the, the fact that we are in this intelligence sensing school is really a useful part where we get people from different disciplines talking to each other. We found it very useful talking to people from a media background, from a biology background, from art background, from interaction, from user interfaces, and so on. We need all this to complete the picture of getting a system that is out there, acceptable by all the users, and useful for different domains and different scenarios. And by that, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed the talk and didn't put you to sleep. And any questions? I know I, I moved a lot for the camera is hell, but I can't stay in one place. <laughs> Thanks. Um, w uh, one thing that, I mean, because I don't know this area, um, I was wondering if signal design is a part of what you need to consider, because it seems like you were describing that you're using um, standard sort of en encoding techniques, and I wonder if there's any sense in which you need to redesign signals for these on-body networks, or if standard approaches are already sort of no, I agree totally. I mean, this is something I missed out of the talk. I mean, especially for the localization. Uh, one of the part that one of the researchers that they're working on is how different modulation technique or cadence technique will give us a better accuracy. And we found out that actually having pulses with a uh, higher derivative of encoding will give us a better accuracy because it protects the signal from interferers, from distortion, from noises, and so on. So it's something we're really looking into that we haven't looked extensively into in the past, but now we started looking uh, into it for future applications, really. Yeah, so it's, it's something here of really great importance for us. It's either I bored you to death or you understood everything. <laughs> if it's the latter, I like it. <laughs> Andre. Can you, can you list the top two problems you The top two problem. We don't understand it much. We don't have enough knowledge. No, I mean, yeah, the, the issue with the signal is that we're not an expert in signal processing. So for, I'll, I'll take an example of an application, the localization issue, which is one of the PhD research there is looking for, is for us is how to get an advanced signal processing in order to clear or filter the signal out, how to actually minimize the error of, of um, repeatability of the measure. For example, one of the biggest issues is that if we do an antenna on a location and then repeat the radio performance again, we have a slight difference because you can't ensure you have exactly the same XYZ coordinates. And, and one of the things we really want to improve on is how can we get reduce these errors or filter out the error because of the slight movements of, of, uh, of the location of the sensor. And I mean, the, the other thing we're looking at is, uh, as, as, as rightly done, uh, pointed there, is the encoding and modulation. We don't have really strong expertise in that field, but we just started looking into, is how we can get different modulation technique or adaptive, really, modulation technique that will allow us to have a better signal quality or BER throughout the different applications. Because ad adapt adaption is really important here. Changes with the requirement, with the system, and with the environment as well.
I'm not sure which group I am in. Okay, sorry. When you when you're getting information from inside the body, you spoke about you get pictures of inside the body. Mm. Um, I don't think they are images, are they? They are. They are images. So which kind of? No, uh, we, I mean we don't do so the images part. We get the radio signal just to make it clear. But okay. there are already system. There's a system, commercial system called Given Imaging from Israel, and it is in use in NHS. But it's the last resort for endoscopy. If you fail everything else, the doctor will say, okay, you have to come, you swallow the capsule, I put seven, eight antennas around the body, and then I can get the signal out of it, or the images out of the system. Okay, not just because you couldn't understand. Oh, okay, yeah. So it's a, a, and also there is a research group in the uh, University of uh, Glasgow working on lab on a pill. I'm not sure if you heard of it, but it's really unique because they, they, they work on improving the electronics, the cameras, and so on, sending data, continuous data, which means videos. It's a, it's a big challenge now. They can't achieve it at the moment because, as I said, as human bodies, we absorb most of the energy. So for video, you really need higher data rate than what they can now. But what they do is a low resolution signal just to see if there's an inflammation that they couldn't spot, if there is something that is really going wrong, because a 24 hours capsule going through your system gives you better a, a, a assessment than just an endoscope that going through the esophagus or the digestion system. <coughs> Thank you for the speech, Akro. I'm also from Montana Group. Okay. And uh, I, I want to know that when you uh, impose the device on, on the body or inside body, it will uh, have some hazard to the house. So how do you balance this uh, when you design the device? Yeah. I mean, for, for, for the hazardous, which I understand what you're meaning, if you put the device on the human body, we, we for the on-body communication, which we put the antenna on the body directly, we ensure that the power transmitter of this device is zero dBm, which is around 330 dBm less than what your mobile phone transmits now What if you have your mobile phone. For the implant devices, we don't actually design the capsules here or we're not allowed to do that. We, it has to be biodegradable, biocompatible. So people working on these capsules, really, they, they, they ensure that the power is minus 16 dBm, meets the requirements, so there's no hazards to any organs around there. And also the, 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 the encapsulation of that electronic device is biocompatible, so it doesn't affect you really. It will leave the system, and they've done tests on that, so there's no problem with that at all. If you want to, we can use you as an example. <laughs> would be really useful. <laughs> but people probably are scared because the mobile phones are in our pocket book while these are inside our body. Yeah. I mean, we don't, we, yeah, we don't expect people to just swallow the pill all the time. It has to be uh, monitored. It has to be within uh, experts, carers to look at that. Be but as I said, it's, it's like any capsule size that, you know, the vitamins you can get from Holland Harris, you swallow it. It, it, it. The size is suitable. It takes picture and then it leaves your system. But I... I Actually, recently, I mean, for the own body, we can't do it as freely as we did in the past because of the issues of ethicals and so on. Once you have the approval, you prove that the power, the output power, as long as the power output is really to the standards or lower than, lower than the standards, you're safe. You have no problem with that. I mean, there's no much... I don't want to create a, a, a debate here, but there's people talking about mobile phone affecting our health based station, but there's no solid evidence of that happening, really. And the power values out of this mobile phone base station are very low. So imagine for wireless devices from your mobile and so on. I know the problem of continuous uh, emission to these devices, but people do a specific absorption rate, how much of the power being absorbed by your tissue. If it's below a certain threshold, then there's no problem at all, which is most of the devices meet these requirements. All right, thank you.